um, hello everybody. Uh, thank you to the audience for joining us and to our panelists for agreeing to take part today. Um, in advance of this discussion, just a bit of, uh, I suppose, a minor housekeeping in terms of the structure. Uh, we see this discussion is broadly divided into two halves. So one thinking about arts from a researcher or a small institution point of view, and the other from a much larger institutional sort of background or with that hat on. Um, we do really want this to be an open discussion. Please do pop your questions into the Q&A. If you would like to ask that question live, we definitely support that and would be happy to pop you on the screen or unmute your mic, whatever you would prefer. Just give us that information in the Q&A box and of course the chat here in order to sort of keep the discussion going. In advance of this uh, session today, we did circulate some questions to our audience um, or to our panelists, I'm sorry, um, just for them to sort of start considering and thinking about the ways in which PIDs and IIIF might be able to work together. Um, so I think let's just start with a general discussion. When we think about user-generated content, be that custom annotations, uh, user-created manifests or bespoke collections, what role do PIDs currently play? What role would we like to see them play? And what sort of barriers are holding us back from that sort of ideal implementation? Who would like to kick us off today? Joe, looks like you. Hi, thank you, Anne. Um, <laughs> you see that mic get unmuted and we're off to the races. <laughs> um, I think from a user point of view, the connection between persistent identifiers and IIIF is one of trust. So if someone is going to do research or someone is going to build resources or presentations based on uh, information and content, video or images or audio uh, from multiple different institutions, they would hope that that content would stay there. Um, so whatever complexity of their work is going to be, if they base it on a resource that then disappears, that could be quite problematic. Um, so I would say that the first, the first bit perhaps to consider is the notion of trust. And if people can trust IIIF resources because they are constructed from persistent identifiers, then that acts as the foundation for the ability to do any work on top of it. Uh, Sarah and Ben, as people who run a platform that deals with doing work on top of IIIF resources, how do you see this playing out in your current role? Well, I, I think it's a real challenge. As I mentioned, when we are used as part of a digitization workflow, oftentimes the annotations that are created, the transcriptions that are created by end users, will end up in a permanent location like a digital library system. The images will also end at the same place, but the IDs have not really been minted yet before we enter the process. Um, so establishing that trust can be hard. And we, we run into this actually with some cases of, of user interface in which an institution after their material has been transcribed and transferred over to a collection management system or a digital library system will want to pull the material off of our platform because from the institutional perspective, they're done. Right. Mm -hmm. But the users who worked on that, who may, whose main interaction with that material was on that platform are horrified to see their material disappear. So I, I think that this issue of trust is, is a real challenge in a lot of cases. Well, and I say trust goes in another way, which is if we're importing material from digital library systems, if so, for instance, you know, well, not gonna name names, sorry, but you know, your image server has to stay up because if it doesn't stay up, your transcribers can't see your images and we're the ones who have to go figure out why. Um, your, your manifests and your, and your identifiers that are in your IIIF manifest have to stay the same or our things break. And that's true too for anything we're producing and people are using our IIIF manifest for, we've changed something recently and we broke some downstream users. So- We had to um, change them back. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> uh, Rachel, I see your hand up. Yes, I was gonna comment that absolutely in terms of user generated content, what we need to be able to do is uh, allow them, as Joe says, to be able to reference and link to and cite the contributions that they've made to our content and really value that. 
but I think I wouldn't be surprised just as devil's advocate if there is nervousness from organizations about what might be seen as a bit of a free-for-all. So anyone can come here, write whatever they want, and we're putting a persistent identifier on it. And then as an organization, I have to maintain and manage that. Um, and I think there would potentially be nervousness around that. I think until we allow people to do it, start putting those persistent identifiers on there, we're never gonna know how much of a problem it is. I think we have to go out there and try it first. Yeah, I think that is an issue with crowdsourced material generally is serving that from an institutional perspective. Andy, I just saw your mic come on. Would you like to contribute? Yeah, so I also think there's a different type of intent. So if when we're agreeing to publish something in IIIF, although we might not have realized it, we are agreeing to publish it in a persistent format so that it can be reused in the way that makes it useful outside of just our institutions or uh, outside of our classroom, whatever it happens to be. But there are other use cases for uh, generating user content which are not meant to be long lived. Things like uh, teaching paleography uh, and so on, where uh, students produce transcriptions, et cetera, as part of their uh, curriculum. That does not need a long lived uh, identifier uh, which uniquely identifies it forever. Um, in the same way that, say, an actual thorough transcription of a work which is going to be reused uh, and become part of that work down the road will. I guess the question there is where do we draw the line between serious research that needs to be citable and sort of recreatable versus work that's being done perhaps as part of class assignment or by students who are still learning and perhaps not ready to share those transcriptions or that translation or whatever it may be with a wider audience. Joe? Um, I completely agree with that, Andy. Um, but I suppose the issue is there's two parts to that classroom. One is the work of the students, which is temporary and ephemeral, but if the image underneath disappears before you can mark the work that the student has done, then there's a problem. Um, I think that the issue of what Rachel has just said about, you know, what are we agreeing to host and what are we agreeing to present is a big deal. Um, and I think that nervousness is, is quite strong in, in many institutions. And it may well be that the initial stumbling, but well, the initial steps are our images will persist but we're not managing what people stick on top of them uh, type thing. And then you have services that perhaps will look at managing annotations or transcriptions or, or comments that will sit on top of them, but that can be managed separately. But the institutions themselves can then just be responsible for their own content and their own resources that they're presenting. So I think because IIIF enables such a spread of use and such an organic use identifying where the responsibility stops and starts between the different players is probably quite important. Not necessarily from a technical point of view, but just so people can relax and say, no, that's not your responsibility. You're just responsible for this bit. And then people can go, okay, we can do that. We have the resources for that. We're able to do that. Um, and I think that's becoming more clear with, with the sort of the use of persistence and then the spread of IIIF is what that scope can be whether you're a huge institution or whether you're a small institution, what you can and cannot do is different. Um, but the persistence of the foundation or the building blocks is still very important. I suppose continuing on from that, thinking about an institutional's commitment to persistence versus perhaps an individual scholarly work product or transcription, translation, collection, whatever it may be, annotations in a triple IF sense. How are we to think about persistence for that? Thinking about the professional researcher or someone who's contributed a lot of time or effort to creating something that they would like to be able to share or cite in triple IF. My feeling is that that's really key for supporting what should be uh, one of our key use cases really 
Um, you know, they're using our material for research that actually down the line will help us as organizations understand the content that we have and the images we're seeing. Mm -hmm. um, so it's not even just about their careers, but it's actually acknowledging the contributions we get from those researchers, which let's face it, as an organization, we're getting that for free. Um, and we should absolutely recognize that. Um, I think that's potentially where the opportunity comes to include not just persistent identifiers for their contributions, but um, as was mentioned before, we can work in their ORCID identifiers so they can link that into their professional profiles. Uh, and we know who's made these contributions so we can acknowledge that. Joe? Sure. Um, well, I was just gonna say that it's, I think, based on the previous webinars we've had to do with IIIF, a lot, a lot of the questions that have come up been balanced on how do you do this if you're a small museum with one member of staff and the only computing IT infrastructure you have is a laptop in the corner that's gathering dust. Um, I think from both the persistent identifier side and the IIIF side that could be quite daunting uh, and I should say that there are resources, a lot of work being done within the IIIF community and what Julian was commenting about ARCs is ARCs, are, you don't pay for them. I mean, I think you have to be a recognized organization to be able to register a, an ARC ID or an ARC a, a number. But there are methods and processes that facilitate the presentation of IIIF content for almost free or for complete free, if you don't mind it being slightly <laughs> Um, and there are possibilities to create persistent identifiers, which are backed up by organizations which uh, are trusted and will persist. So it is possible, though slightly harder, for smaller institutions to also join in these activities as well as big ones. But the investment of their personal time relative to the resource of their entire organization is obviously much bigger because you've already got one member of staff and if you spend your time doing that, then that's a bigger chunk of your resource time. But it is possible. Uh, Sarah and Ben. Uh, going back. Actually, can I, talk, can I address the small organization before we think sure. of that? Yes. We have two points to make. Um, so what, we actually work with a lot of very small organizations and um, a surprising number of them, a medium number of them use IIIF without even realizing it. So a lot of small institutions host material on the Internet Archive. Internet Archive has a IIIF endpoint. People use it to pull stuff into, into systems like ours. Um, OCLC's Content DM also supports IIIF, and a lot of small and medium-sized institutions will use IIIF. So making it seamless, and they don't even, you know, you don't have to know, <laughs> right? You just take advantage of, of the benefit of having these persistent identifiers that can help you pull information from one system to another. And I think that is the way to, to kind of uh, scoop up all of your small institutions that don't have deep IT resources. And, and for my part, I wanted to go back to what uh, Rachel was saying about crediting people. Um, and particularly the, the difference between a serious scholarly researcher who has an ORC ID versus a student as Andy's case. Um, we are at the tail end of a uh, National Endowment for the Humanities funded project at University of Texas Libraries to explore the role of contributors and how to credit them. Uh, and so surveys have been conducted of the different institutions that use our platforms to say, how do they credit people who have transcribed? Uh, and found real variations in terms of what kinds of credit they provide people, whether they credit anyone at all, the differentiation between crediting volunteers versus crediting staff members in an organization that traditionally doesn't credit staff members for doing the same work. Um, and so the approach that we've taken is to look at two things, how to credit and then whether to credit and how to credit we try to provide people with a range in between uh, one extreme of pseudonymity. So you've got a student in a classroom who does not for, has privacy concerns and does not want to be identified, all the way to real names with ORC IDs that will be attached to everything they do. When to credit is something we still haven't worked out yet. And we kind of leave it up to the organizations. Right, technically we do, mm. but the best practices, we don't know. But I'll, I'll paste that study into the chat. Yep. Uh, 
Excuse me, uh, Julian. In discussing sort of free IDs and work IDs, um, do you think there's a place for this within the uh, kind of personally created IIIF resources? I mean, I should hope so. We we do have a crowdsourcing project at the university, and um, so we also want to enable end users to annotate IIIF resources. But the question here is, how do we? I mean, technically, it's not that difficult, but the problem is really curating those annotations, which annotations are better than the other or which one should go first. And and now we have to think of um, also maybe attributing IDs or personal IDs for some of those, for all of those, and how do we uh, curate that? And, and that's one part because we know that we want annotations or more information on those resources. But then if you think of, Maybe in a few years, when this collection will be more uh, famous, famous than, than other scholars will want to annotate that. And if it is on their own GitHub account, if they have one or whatever they want, wherever they want to host those annotations with or without person IDs, it's, it's a good thing. But then how do we, how do we get notified about this? Um, there is a link data notification, for example, but I think that also here, we, it's not only about curating what you know, but it's also about aggregating what you don't know about your own resources. That's, and then how do you make that persistent? That's, um, well, that's a commitment. And if trusted that, then I think we should also enable that. Uh, Joe, you got your head up. The one thing that's, Slightly tricky about persistent identifiers on IIIF is, is well, IIIF it kind of comes with the, the, with the turf, but a persistent identifier, as Rachel highlighted, needs to ideally resolve to something. So you can register an ID somewhere, and great, I've got an ID, it's going to persist. But if someone sticks it into a web browser, something has to come back. Um, and that something that comes back is the bit that needs to persist. Um, it can evolve and it can extend and develop, but I suppose the core metadata that describes the thing you have your ID for uh, needs to persist. And that one does potentially get slightly harder. Uh, I mean, to be consistent with how you reference a thing, uh, you can get an ID quite quickly, but then to have or decide where that ID points to is another question that needs to be explored. I was going to mention on uh, Julian's QA point um, that also persistent identifiers shouldn't, and we should absolutely get the messaging right on this, say anything about the quality of what the thing is. <laughs> so um, just because we might maintain a persistent identifier to an annotation, we're not saying that annotation is right. All the persistent identifier is vouching for is that you're going to be able to get to whatever that thing was, not that it's any good. Um, so I do think we need to be careful and ensure that that message gets across, you know, in the way that um, you'll frequently find written um, in some books. Well, there's a copy of this in the British Library. And it's like that, we've got a copy of it, but that doesn't mean it's there because we like it. We just have to take a copy <laughs> of everything. So uh, yeah, I think there needs to be a clear message about persistent identifiers vouching for the quality of persistence, not the quality of the content. Yeah, I think there is an inherent issue there in terms of what we were talking about in terms about trust, basically. If I see something cited or on the website of the National Library of Paris or the National Library of France or on Gallica, my instinct is that that is also being vouched for by the library or by the institution. Um, but clearly from what persistence is saying, it's just that it's there and that you can find it. Um, how that works, I think, is another question. Um, Yeah, Joe? Um, I suppose that, that then depends on what information exists when you go to what the PID points at. Um, because I think if, if something is part of 
or is owned and authored by, this comes back to the attribution, which is, which is extremely important. If you've got clear attribution of who's responsible for uh, an image or a video or just an annotation or a comment, um, you could see who's responsible for it. Um, so it's, it's, that starts to help that issue, is that just because a large organization is aggregated or can provide you access to a piece of information, unless it says this was authored by the British Library, then it's not actually their responsibility to some extent. It's, it's, it's whoever actually is name or institution is down there and who created it and who produced it. So the, the, the attribution bit works two ways. One, it's to ensure that people have credit for the work that they've done, but also indicating the responsibility of who put that information up there in the first place. Yeah, so in bed. I, I think there's an interesting question of scope here, and, and I'm gonna play a little bit of devil's advocate, but if you own an item, if you are the holding institution for an item, a PID is absolutely makes sense, right? Like it, it seems obvious. Um, an annotation on that item, eh, you didn't write it. It may or may not have been created in one of your systems. Um, you get to choose whether or not it's something you put a PID on. And, and I would argue what we see with, with transcriptions is they are not permanent until they get pulled into another system someplace else. And that other system generally has an identifier for the item and the transcription just becomes metadata on the item. And that's probably good enough. It would be good to have credit and stuff like that. But like, I, I don't know that you have to think about putting a PID on every single piece of content and layer of content on top of an item, especially not yet, <laughs> right? Let's solve the easy problems first. Yeah, I also think it's slightly tricky for those of us that have chosen persistent identifiers that contain some kind of non-opaque data, like an ARC with a name authority in it, because it inherently makes it seem as though that data is belonging to that organization when mm -hmm. it may not be, right? So uh, even though there's tons of other benefits for them um, in other ways. We, we have had systems where you could end up with more than one persistent identifier for the same piece of data. So it's almost like you can create a persistent identifier when someone authors some content, and that would be something they've organized themselves. And then if an institution aggregates that data and absorbs it into their own system, they may well give it uh, an additional persistent identifier, which hopefully will acknowledge and link to the original mm -hmm. one. Um, uh, it, it's because it, it just may well be how systems work. So uh, one of the links that were provided right at the start to the simple IIIF discovery system that we've been building in the project, as highlighted when exploring certain institutions, their persistent identifiers can be quite varied. And then how you process the use of uh, URLs with these persistent identifiers in them may change depending on what the format of that ID was. So you can end up with collections with five, six, seven, eight, X different types of IDs, but it's, I think that's, we just need to accept that we will have multiple shapes and sizes of ID. And as long as they resolve, and as long as they provide the content and information, then it's kind of the onus is on the people creating the use cases to be able to cope with that. Um, but you can have multiple persistent IDs and they can have multiple levels of importance, shall we say. Uh, if you maintain your own little list of something, that may well not be seen as quite as important as if a large institution has stated their credibility on the fact that it's going to persist. Um, uh, Julian, you've added a comment to the chat. Uh, would you care to expand on that a little bit? Uh, yeah, I mean, it's generally speaking, in most ARCs, you will find you will have the ARC label and the NAN, but actually it's not monetary at all. So it so depends how you set up your resolver, but then uh, also what's difficult, I think when you, whether ARC or other scheme, if at the beginning, when you start assigning those identifiers, you, you think of what you have, and most of the time, not what you're going to have in the future. So 
that also may be a burden when you have to within again redo your resolver or just uh, assuming that you don't know uh, are going to have different types of resources or different types of annotation and so on and so on but that's just yeah <laughs> another thought Yep, uh, Andy Corrigan uh, has popped a comment into the chat as well. Andy, would you like to just join the discussion and ask it live? Uh, yeah, um, yeah, I mean, um, I just think when we have such a varied amount of material from all over the place that we pull together in Cambridge Digital Library that um, kind of I wish we could have a PID for every digital object but trying to do one for every aspect of that digital object just it just wouldn't it's just completely unviable really um it might be it might be a great thing to aim for but I, I'm not sure I'm just not sure it would work in practice I think that is a concern for organisations with larger collections. Um, and what one of the things we've advocated is taking a, an approach where you think about parts of a collection and then slowly break down the granularity as you kind of discover the use cases and the need that you might have as an organisation. So rather than doing, you know, a, a per image or per page, persistent identifier have one for the item uh, and that encompasses all the images uh, potentially all the annotations and metadata at an item level and start going down and I think you know knowing Cambridge probably that's still quite a bit of an overhead in itself um, but I think we can take a bit of a pragmatic approach to just doing what we can um, and at least trying to when we're digitizing content have persistent identifiers for the units that we think will be useful to our users. Uh, I don't think we have to go and do everything at once. Um, some of the conversations have got me thinking about the kind of the versioning question, which is always going to come around again. And certainly at the British Library, we might redigitize something and have better quality images. And then what are we doing about persistent identifiers for those? Are they new persistent identifiers? Are we reusing them? Um, and yeah, that's probably a very, very big question, which we could spend a whole time on potentially. I suppose that does sort of raise the issue of what is a minimum acceptable level for persistence? Is it that it goes back to the object? If you have new images, how does that work in, um, et cetera? Uh, Lynn, you asked an excellent question in the chat. Uh, would you care to share it with us? Sure, thank you. Um, so I'm the IIIF technical coordinator, so I know more about IIIF than PIDs, but my question was, um, are there two different types of persistent identifiers? So, for example, in, in Julian's example of the, the ARC, um, if you were to follow that, you get to kind of like an about page of the digital item. Um, but then there's also the IIIF link, which has that ARC kind of embedded in the URL. And my question to the panel really is, how are users to know about these different identifiers and when they should use which particular identifier? I know from my previous experience at the National Library of Wales, we used to use handles for things. Um, and that was quite easy to explain to users because they were public and they'd follow it and then they'd get to the item. Um, but the IIIF link was kind of very hidden in the background. And so how could we kind of expose that to people and explain where and when you could use that type of identifier? I think that the simplest answer for me is that we should have clear copy and paste this. <laughs> this is the link we use and this is the citation uh, and we should make that visible to users. I think I think it depends a lot on what the PID points at. So one of the things we've been exploring is we, we give PIDs to paintings and then a triple F manifest of images about that painting is achieved by a suffix on the same persistent identifier. Um, or you can give a persistent identifier for each individual image, then depending on what you're going to do with them. Um, I think that's the bit where uh, some systems are sort of learning now exactly what is the most efficient way of, of using persistent identifiers, because the easy one is just throw one at everything. But if you've got millions of objects, that's not really practical, as has been expressed. And I think a lot of it comes down to the work that we're doing. A lot of it comes down to 
documentation is that if you want to hang other resources off a thing, it needs a PID. Um, and if it's just the end, if it's a variable, if it's a piece of information related to an object, it might not need a PID, it's just, just a number or just a piece of text. Um, but it's the use cases that start to answer these questions. And the more robust, clear use cases you have, the more clear it becomes where these persistent identifiers are required to join knowledge together. I mean, that's the point is that resolvable PIDs are used as the linchpins between knowledge that you connect, whether it's a persistent identifier to an annotation or whether it's a book to a page or whether it's an individual data point in a huge data cloud of some analytic examination. It's that relationship that's important. And when you need to talk about that relationship, you need something to hang that conversation from. Uh, John, I see you've got your hand up. Uh, yeah, I uh, wanted to just address Andy Corrigan's comment. Um, if you're using ARCs, you, you're not paying for any of your registration. So you could, if you wanted to, you could register a thousand different uh, you know, elements within an image or any digital object. But there's a simpler way that a lot that permits you just just register the top level of the object and use something called suffix pass through uh, through the N2T resolver, and that means that you you don't actually have to mm -hmm. register or manage uh, more than one arc for all of those to get to all of those things. So I think it's quite straightforward, basically. To do with arcs. And, and I think this is where I confess that in terms of what we do at the British Library, we don't necessarily properly follow the standards <laughs> to do all of that. So we're, we, don't, we don't necessarily uh, practice what we preach in terms of use of arcs, but absolutely that should make the overheads in terms of management um, a lot easier. And one other, just one other comment, if I may, it's, uh, it has to do with this concept of um, uh, because arcs are quite flexible um, and you can throw them away easily, um, it's easy to, to develop workflows where you assign arcs to the very beginning of an object long before you've, making, you're, you've made a preservation decision. So uh, if you decide, yes, we're gonna preserve this, then you already have a preservation ready identifier. It's ready to go and you don't have to actually rename it at the moment when it decide, it's proven its value, which it can be disruptive in its own way. Um, so you just keep it. And there are there other arts, you just, you just throw them away. And if you've been careful in your workflows, you have to release them to the public. So there's no damage. I mean, your, you know, your credibility isn't affected because you don't actually go public with it until you're ready to make that decision. I think that's a fair point and a wise approach. Um, Anthony, a while ago, you put the questions to the Q&A. Would you care to raise it now? Um, yes, yeah, so I was just wondering uh, what the, the pros and cons of sort of non-opaque PIDs are uh, over something that's sort of human readable. Um, and um, I was reading about the use of the suffix pass-through on ARCs and how does that mm -hmm. help, help with that possibly? I'd be happy to take a stab at that, but I'll let others go. I was just going to say just a quick thing is if you put too much human sort of readable information in your PIDs, you have the problem is that people's understanding of what that meaning is changes. So you, we, we have an issue is that uh, we have had URLs used within the National Gallery that use the title of the painting. So we have 30 odd paintings that are called Portrait of a Man and similar, I think, high 20s of Portrait of a Woman. Um, so if you start to use, well, that's that's the title. That's obviously how someone will know how, yeah, but which one? And then you end up with a number at the end and a prefix, and then the title changes for some other reason. Is a lot of that human readable information changes. And that's what the metadata, the resolver should present to you will give you. To some extent, the PIDs, you aren't gonna type a PID into a URL on the whole. Well, some of us mad idiots do, but most of the time it's it's the connections that happen in the background. Um, so you'd run a search based on the title and you, the objects you get back will have pins on them. And that's how you would document or connect. But uh, John, you raised the idea of suffix pass through. Um, and Julian, I know you commented about this in the chat. 
Would you care to respond to Anthony's question? It seems like that's uh, right. Yeah, I, I agree with Joseph. Um, it is, um, you know, there's, uh, there's this terrible tension, you know, opaque identifiers are just painful to deal with, but they're so useful for, at least for backroom people and certain mm -hmm. kinds of usability. So the ARC approach is pretty hybrid, really. It says that you want the top level object should be opaque. It's the, you're making a commitment to this top level object. Uh, that's the preservation, that's the center of your preservation activity. But the, the extensions that you'll do to get to elements of that object, you might as well make them non-opaque, like thumbnail. You know, uh, you could say it's not thumbnail or chapter four or, um, certain kinds of usability because your commitment is to the object and as as the years roll by the decades roll by you know that thumbnail is going to change it's going to be a higher resolution in 10 years that OCR will have gotten better and it will be replaced but you're still honoring your commitment to persistence but you you know you can you can combine usability with uh, the opaque the benefits of opacity for that top level object. That's the ARC approach and recommendation. Uh, Julian, do you want to follow that up? No, no, I don't have anything to add. Oh, great, <laughs> all right. I just saw you nodding along. Uh, just nodding. <laughs> um, Sarah, I noticed in the chat this idea that you also kind of pass the ball down the field. So name the ball and then continue to use it. Is that something you guys are embracing it from the page or at Brumfield Labs in general? Yeah, we do a lot of work with uh, digital documentary editions um, that often start with digitization and flow through to a, doc a digital documentary edition site. And so I, I often talk to, to those projects with this metaphor of you know passing a ball down the field and you want an identifier that's the ball, right? That you can like, the metaphor falls apart, but you can start hanging things off of as it goes from, you know, uh, digitization into a content system, from a content system into a transcription system, um, someplace where you do metadata, and then you take all of that and you pull it into something like Omeka S to do a digital edition site. So we have a number of projects that, that do that and uh, try to keep track of the same item in all three or four systems that they're using. So we'll signing the ID at the very beginning. It's the only way to do it, right? <laughs> Otherwise, you lose it. Uh, yes, Joe. Um, I was just going to say, I mean, we have been experimenting with ARCs a bit, and there's lots of documentation on ARCs explaining how you're supposed to structure your ARC ID. But uh, one of the things we've done is we had an internal ID system based on an alphanumeric string and effectively, we were able to construct arcs by just sticking the arc and our institutional code on the front of the existing ID. So the ideas we had were opaque. They, they were unique to the individual things we were dealing with inside. But we only then had to create an external resolvable uh, persistent ID for the objects that we needed to publish or present or, or talk about externally. So the arc approach allowed us to do that on our own requirement basis. Um, so we've registered the, the information and then we can have, if someone puts a code in with the ARC uh, uh, prefix at the start, with the uh, resolver, it just brings you to the metadata that's required. So it's quite a flexible system um, to make use of identifiers that you already have internally institution. Now, technically breaks some of the documentation. So people may tell me that you shouldn't do that, but it seems to work. So it's something we're experimenting with. Yep. Um, Ed, I noticed you raised a question earlier in the chat or a thread of discussion about Internet Archive and working with that. Uh, would you care to kind of follow that up now? Um, I'll try. Uh, so I'm, I've had an interest in um, things like IPFS for a while. Since, they were, since IPFS was launched, I've been experimenting with it, um, combining it with IIIF. And uh, I was invited to present about it at the Internet Archive a few years ago at the summit. And, uh, I shared the, um, 
the presentation or the long form of it. Um, and since then, I've, I've managed to get it to actually work um, and I've demonstrated it. Um, and it's just one form of, I, th I think you could call it a persistent ID. I mean, the, the, the goal with protocols like IPFS, there are other ones um, uh, to kind of for permanent storage and for decentralized storage. So, and, and the IDs are generated, they're a hash of the, the content itself. It's got nothing to do with the institution or, or anything else. It's just purely from, you know, the, the content. So if you change one, one bit in, in, in a JPEG, it's a different hash. And because you've got this kind of reliable way of addressing content, uh, you, you can tr fully trust what you're going to get is exactly the thing you're requesting. Um, but also, you, you don't have the issue of what if the server goes down, because it, it can be persisted elsewhere. And uh, there's no kind of uh, king node, if you like. Uh, there are lots of nodes, potentially. And I saw the potential for that, of, you know, institutions collaborating and pinning each other's uh, hashed content uh, to provide a kind of a, um, a resilient network, but it's not really caught on. <laughs> um, but yeah, I, I, I sort of went ahead and made my own demo anyway, because uh, I also am interested in allowing uh, smaller institutions uh, who are my clients generally uh, to, to publish IIIF. So I, I made a tool for publishing IIIF on GitHub, but that can also, because of the way it works, it, it, it's all file-based, it's file system-based. I can generate IPFS hashes of everything in that folder as well. And that, that includes the, the triple life manifest, the, the original image or the tiles and everything else. So, yeah. Well, Olga, I think that feeds nicely into your earlier comments about your dream for having a triple IF kind of platform that could be personalized. Do you want to expand on that and how you see PIDs playing a role? I could do that. Can you hear me? Yes. Uh, I think that uh, some part of the problem is that, uh, sorry, uh, is that we only work with IIIF with uh, persistent identifiers on institutional level. And uh, as soon as we uh, go a little down and uh, let everyone understand what it is and what's the benefit of it. Uh, it could be used freely, openly, and uh, without you know, hesitation about trust. So uh, I think that, uh, say, I take a picture from uh, whatever national library. I do my research, my I don't know, transcription, translation, uh, anything. And uh, I publish it somewhere in my country. Uh, so no one except those who speak the same language or live in the same country or have personal connections with me uh, knows about it. So if we have such platform, which, uh, you know, like simply like medium, uh, where you can go like registered, have your get your personal ID or use the existed like uh, org ID, uh, then link to the manifest uh, for the triple I, uh, triple IF object and um, put your contribution, and um, that would be perfect if this platform could uh, auto generate. Uh, ARC ID or I don't like DOI personally, but it's okay. <laughs> uh, any type of uh, persistent identifier. So uh, that every contribution could be uh, simply linked by uh, having only three um, strings like manifest ID, personal ID and uh, contribution like persistent identifier. Uh, John, I think 
Olga's comment leads nicely into what you put in the chat about the questions about discovery apparatus and how these things will persist into the future. Would you like to expand on that? Uh, were you uh, talking to me uh, with that question? Uh, John Lowe is what I was looking for, but John. Okay. Roy? I'm not inspired myself, but I'll let someone else, I'll pass. I think uh, I'll, I'll comment. No, John's looking back. At, oh, John's back. Okay. Yep. I, <clears throat> you're talking to me, John Lowe? Uh, yes, to you, John Lowe. Um, yeah. Just your comment Hi. in the so, chat about was, discovery apparatus kind of a, and future persistence. Uh, right. So I was wondering so, you know, certainly the, the PID itself, well, we talked about how to persist that. That seems not to be a problem. But if the, uh, the triple IF, and, and the suffix pass through apparatus assumes that there's some way of describing the details of the object. And that's not been universalized or standardized. I'm just wondering how in the future we would figure out how to make sure that people can find all the details of, a, of an object. Uh, Joe? Um, I think a lot of this is, is I, I'm not sure if everyone knows, but there's a, an acronym, I dropped it in the chat right at the start, called FAIR. And it stands for Findable, Accessible, Interoperable and Reusable. Um, and it's one of these acronyms that has been massively funded um, and is actually quite, you know, you can follow bits of it, but it's quite a complex idea. But the basis of it is that you want to ensure that people understand and can find the content and know how they can use it. So I think part of the notion of persistence is looking at what metadata comes back when you resolve a PID. So I think in the use case of looking at pass-through, ideally the top level PID should tell you what pass-through options are available underneath it. And whether that's a, a, a consistent across hundreds of them or thousands of them or whatever, uh, I mean, that'd be to do with how a resolver is set up. Um, so I think that would be quite important because you may have different pass-through options in the same institution. So the only way to really ensure that people can find the documentation requirement would be at that upper level, the bit that uh, was expressed as being the persistent hub, as it were, for the description of all of the digital information about that particular object. So I think that that would be ideally the best place to put it. And then it starts to, uh, to uh, move on to the notion of a fair digital object. So if you've got a digital object, it has a persistent identifier, be it a IIIF resource or a, 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 any sort of data resource. It's looking at the agreement of what metadata is required to hang off that fair digital object to make sure it makes sense to other people and people do know how to use it and what it's for. So I think that discovery apparatus you're describing is something that's being explored um, on a fairly core level of, of sort of internet and information is that notion of a fair digital object and how you ensure that the appropriate documentation or standardization is achieved to make sense of that information. Uh, John, I just saw you on mute your mic. Did you have a follow-up? Um, yeah, I think the, the idea of discovering all the possibilities that exist uh, inside of an image or a digital object is kind of a thorny thing. You definitely want to be able to say, persistently reference the detail in a painting, right? So someone, a human being has discovered something, they want to reference the detail, cite it somewhere. But if you're at the top level, the I, it's pretty tricky to try to enumerate all the possible details that might exist, which is all the, all the tiles of all the different sizes so that would even be a could be a you know quite a cognitive burden uh, to try to enumerate that in a discovery system. So there has to be some balance, and I don't I don't honestly know what it is, but um, I agree that we it's a, there's an unexplored area. Um, how do you at the very least associate with that cited detail metadata about about that? So um, but the other the other problem is pretty thorny still. 
computer, yes. Yeah, I, I just threw in a comment in the chat that this started to remind me of, of the Memento system for uh, getting uh, timed versions of resources that the, the API returns via 302s, I think, and 304s. It, it returns all your options for, for resolution and the, the client can then decide which one it needs. So it has that mechanism. I mean, it, it's built into HTTP. There's that mechanism for returning lists of options and uh, let, letting the client make an informed choice of, of which one they want. And Andy, I've seen you nodding up in the corner. Well, of my screen, you're up in the corner. Um, would you like to follow up? Well, I'm in the middle of my screen, um, but yes. <laughs> Uh, no, there's some interesting uh, things. So I, I just want to go back to what Ed was saying a little bit about um, uh, IPFS hashes, et cetera, and just how that contrasts with what I think some of the other things we were talking about, which were retiring identifiers and replacing content where necessary. So we're talking about making a distinction between the intellectual entity um, that we're addressing with a persistent identifier and then the kind of physical pixels or uh, information uh, about an image um, that's addressed through this kind of content hash um, that we can't change without changing the hash that we get. Um, and that kind of uh, distinction um, that kind of Joe was also kind of mentioning about how uh, you can build an arc from your own internal identifier, because of course we can, it's just, it's just an identifier. Um, but we also, you know, we do want to be able to kind of replace things uh, over time while still being able to resolve that kind of intellectual object. I wasn't sure where I was going with that, but I just want to kind of jump back to it and throw it back out to the panel. I mean, I suppose that is a question. If things are being replaced, there's new imaging, uh, say new names, new attributions. What do we do with the old ones? Um, the idea of persistence means that they need to still exist, but they could also be out of date. Uh, Rachel? I think at least use of persistent identifiers allows us to maintain metadata about what it used to be. Um, so the fact with that we can say this no longer exists for X, Y, Z reason, but here is the available information that we can tell you about it. And we should absolutely try and make use of those aspects. Um, the persistent identifiers for intellectual objects, I think there is a very strong case uh, that we need to look at how we do that. Uh, and I think some of that ties into other persistent identifiers that we could link in from elsewhere. So, you know, other vocabularies, Wikidata, et cetera, uh, are making use of other people's persistent identifiers for intellectual items uh, and anything else we might want to reference around our content as well. Uh, Joe, yes. Um, I just wanted to drop in another example of um, practical persistent identifiers uh, as our practical IIIF project sort of focus on pr uh, practical aspects. I don't know how many people have played with uh, a platform called Zenodo. Uh, Zenodo is or has been designed as a way of publishing data in relation to projects or publications or activities or just data in its own right. You can publish software on there. It's free, it's backed by CERN um, and they have promised it will persist for as long as their research project ongoes, which is funded at least for the next 20 years. And if you upload data into Zenodo, you get a DOI. If you upload more data, you'll get another DOI, but you also have a DOI for the group of things you've uploaded. Now, technically speaking, Zenodo, if you upload a big image in there, it uses IIIF to give you the thumbnail. You can create a manifest for it, uh, pop it into a IIIF zooming viewer. It stops very quickly because they have a limiter on the number of requests you can do. But the new version of that software is going to support IIIF uh, more fully. So this is a platform that people can use now for individual work, for individual researchers. Uh, to put content up, whether they're imaging or other types of content, 
and get a persistent identifier that you can then reference in a publication, you can reference in an email or in an article or just with, use within your own internal documentation for smaller institutions. So um, I just thought I'd raise that as it's a, a useful resource and it might be something that's it's applicable for a range of different users. But in a way, if you're uploading that image to Tizono and then adding your annotation to whatever, that's no longer a triple IF instance. You have taken that image and are uploading it separately, even though it's displayed by a triple IF um, through the NVIDIA RDM. Yes, yes. I mean, basically, you get when they upload up, update to the new version of the software, uh, it would provide you with a manifest and that will yes. have Canvas ID. So uh, effectively, if you wanted to uh, attach annotations that would persist onto that persistent foundation, you would need to migrate them to the ID that was created by Zenodo when you were doing mm -hmm. the work. Um, just as a little plug, uh, our Practical Triple IF project has uploaded all of our previous webinars and, and the content for this webinar will also be uploaded to um, Zenodo. Yep. Uh, so it's easy uh, the to find. The links for all of those are earlier in the chat. Uh, thanks to Francis. Uh, Rachel, I noticed your hand up. Yes, I know we're coming to the end, so I hope I'm not opening a massive can of worms. But my question is around um, content that we will eventually be able to use AAA for that has more than two dimensions. So whether 3D materials or time-based uh, materials, um, are there any topics around persistent identification that we should be thinking about and considering now? Uh, yes, Joe. Well, I was, I was going to say that the IIIF specification has gone beyond simple images and does deal with audiovisual and audio now. And I have seen implementations of that that allow you to effectively cite a small snippet of a video from a three hour film. Um, so you don't need to crop it. You don't need to pull out of that small section. You, you can just reference the little bit of interest that people can then see and view and watch. So they have the use cases to start to do that practically. Uh, when it comes to 3D models, uh, if Ed is still around, he probably can comment on this a lot more than me. They are working on the structure of how to do IIIF for 3D. Um, it is quite complex. There are working implementations of various aspects of that. There's some very nice examples presented in the universal viewer structure under exhibit.so. Uh, where you can see some very nice models. So there are starting to be the technical use cases to show how the time-based or 3D-based materials would be used and where you might want persistent identifiers off them. So uh, I guess it comes down to how uh, the previous comment I made about which hooks you want to hang more information off would indicate where you might want persistent identifiers in an evolving 3D model basically, because if you picked a PID for every single pixel or voxel or, or whatever system you want to use, you start to end up with a lot of them very quickly, which is, which is fair enough. But highlighting the generation of a persistent identifier based on the creation of new knowledge attached to it would probably be most, uh, well, most feasible in the short term anyway. Yep. Uh, Sarah and Ben, I saw you guys nodding quite a bit during the first bit of Joe's comment. Would you like to add on to that? Uh, so we're involved in a project that does uh, audio and video uh, publishing on GitHub, like Ed mentioned that he does for some smaller institutions, although I think that inherently has some problems, but you know, you kind of do what you can do at the moment. Um, and I put a link into information about that project uh, into the chat. It basically allows researchers to, to annotate audio or video material and publish it as static websites on GitHub. And we wrap everything in a triple IF manifest and use web annotations. All right, so I see we've got two minutes left. Um, we could just ask for each of our panelists and those who have joined us for the discussion here um, for just their final thoughts. Triple IF and PIDs. What's good, what's bad, and where should we go from here? Uh, Rachel, can we start with you for that? <laughs> 
Sorry, I was just typing something something into oh, the chat. My apologies. Um, no, that's <laughs> fine. It wasn't it wasn't for a summing up. I think I was just going to say that the discussion I think has really supported the idea that all of this stuff is there already. Uh, and what we need to do is just work together to continue to move forward and, and join together all the pieces, really. All the pieces of the jigsaw puzzle are there, and we just need to work with them to, to build that picture up. Um, I think, especially in terms of persistent identifiers, it's just understanding whether the ones that we have now are definitely working. You know, it sounds like lots of institutions are using ARCs. They seem to work really well for the, the scale of the content that we have, as well as the technical functionality. And the missing bit is the, the smaller organizations again and their lack of technical capacity. Uh, and I think we need to understand how we can help those organizations move forward um, when they don't have the staff. It's not even about the money for me. I think it's about the staff capacity. And looks like she might have frozen slightly. I was just about to say the same thing. Why don't you go next? <laughs> Joe, do you want to go next? <laughs> oh, okay, I'll go next. Um, I, I would very much agree with what Rachel has just said, that a lot of the tools are out there. I, I think a lot of the process with dealing with persistent identifiers is just sitting down with a pen and pencil and scribbling on a piece of paper and thinking of how stuff connects together and planning what you do. Uh, I mean, I've created a few systems within the National Gallery that we've called persistent, but we've put beta all over them, knowing that they're not going to be. Uh, we've managed to keep them persisting, but um, we've been experimenting and we've had live experiments of how we might be able to do things. And I think that's part of it as well. As long as you allow people to understand what you're doing as an experiment so that they don't then invest three year of project on top of what you've done, it's good to start moving forward. Uh, look at what free services are there, look at what things you can explore. There's lots of training material on IIIF, there's growing issues to do with how you can engage with GitHub, although people get scared of it, and I would agree there are various issues with that, um, but there are free platforms. You can start, you can try, and then that will inform a more robust solution in the future. But as long as you document what you've done, you can then continue wrapping that in what you do in the future. Thanks, Joe. I'm conscious we're over time now, but um, in the order that we did the introductions, uh, Sarah and Ben, do you want to do a quick um, sum up? Yeah, I just uh, agree with Rachel. I now have uh, something like a dozen new tabs open. We have a lot of work to do, I think. This has been great. Thanks. And Andy, we'll give the last word to you. Oh, well, just briefly. Uh, I just I'm going to disagree with Joe, but agree with Rachel that I don't think it's a technical uh, problem as such as it is one of uh, making a decision up front. And we have the means of to go back to uh, Rachel's point about kind of connecting to other identifiers. We have that means uh, through linked data in IIIF through the kind of see also um, or the like, mm -hmm. same as property. Um, but it doesn't make sense in most contexts because they're not the same work, et cetera. Um, so yeah, there's loads of, loads of things to explore there. All right, um, back now, sorry for dropping out midway. My internet connection decided it was no longer going to play ball. Um, however, uh, thank you to all of our panelists. Thank you to our participants, our attendees, um, and all of those who have contributed to the discussion. Um, all of this will be put on Zenodo, along with all the slides, recordings, and transcripts. Um, and we'll send out an email to all attendees when that's ready to go, with the DOI included, of course. Um, it will also be published on the National Collection uh, YouTube channel for the videos. Um, that I don't know if YouTube counts as a DOI, but they certainly have a URL, which will share that. <laughs> Um, so thank you again, and um, we wish you all a good evening, good afternoon, good night, wherever you may be joining us from, um, and thank you again. Have a nice evening.